Praise the Lord. We're going to take a journey today into the Word of God. So let's turn to first, no, second Samuel. I wrote it down wrong. It's second Samuel chapter 12. We're going to revisit David, King David. And lest you think that I just purposely pick these texts because I just want to pick these texts, that's not the case, actually. That is not the case whatsoever. Um, I really pray and read through the Scripture and meditate and try to get a sense of um, what the Lord wants to share. So sometimes the things we share we really want to share. Sometimes it's true, but it's kind of heavy, and you, maybe you don't really want to share it, but it's the Word of God, so we're going to share it anyway. I feel like today's kind of a mixture. And, um, but we are going to look at David. This is a very uh, you know, famous account. We've talked about it a lot. We talk about it frequently, but there's some elements that we have to revisit here. Normally, in the past, when we focused on David and his sin with Bathsheba. And th- th- you got to keep it down, Melissa. You got to keep it down. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, normally, when we talk about that, um, it's in the context of the mercy of God on David's life. And there's a good reason for that. And we're going to look at that. That's the first thing we're going to look at. Um, l- let's just pray, Father. I pray over this text that we're looking at out of 2 Samuel and all the ensuing verses. I pray, Father God, cause our minds to be sharp. I pray for Melissa in the translation. I pray for clarity. I pray against distractions. I just pray, Father, for concentration. And I pray, Lord, that you will truly speak through your word to us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so I'm not going to go over verse 1 to 4 because that's just where Nathan approaches David and confronts him with his sin. We're familiar with that. David had committed this horrendous sin, committed adultery, and then murder, and then he covered it up, and then he took um, Uriah's wife and just brought her in as if nothing. And now she's pregnant, and as far as David is concerned, he's covered it up. He's covered his tracks. A few people know about it, but they won't say anything. So as far as David is concerned, it's already kind of in the past until Nathan the prophet comes along. I want to tell you something. That's why we need prophets in our lives, because human nature is such that we often want to hide our shameful deeds in the past and let them just be buried there forever. But we will not be able to face God on the day of judgment if we just hide our sinful deeds of the past. We've got to face these things now. I mean, I frequently pray, God, if there's anything that I'm that I've not aware of, that I've forgotten about, Lord, bring it into the light now. Let me deal with my sin now. Let me deal with all my sin today. I don't want to deal with it later. It's too late. The cleansing of the blood is for today, is for now. We need to walk in the light today, not tomorrow. Don't put off for tomorrow what you ought to do today. And so we're thankful because by our fallen human nature. There's often times we don't want to face our past. We don't want to face the darkness within us. We don't want to face our shameful deeds. Nobody does. But the grace of God comes, and God came through the prophet Nathan, and he confronted David. Now, David is king. He could kill Nathan. Prophets are bold, and they're not afraid to die for the sake of the Word of God. Nowadays, we have so many types of preachers that they preach what people want to hear only. I don't believe those are real preachers. I don't believe those are true men of God. They really are preaching, but I don't believe those are true men of God. A true man of God is going to preach it whether you want to hear it or not. Why? Why don't you just tell me what I want to hear? Well, that's like telling your child when they're little, just eat all, they all, eat whatever you want to eat. Okay, I want to eat candy, I want to eat cake, I want to eat ice cream, and that's all I'm going to eat. Is is that what you're going to do with your child? No, because they'll die. They'll get sick. They won't grow. They'll they'll have diseases. You're not going to feed a child only what they want because they need more than what they want. And sometimes the things they need the most are what they want the least. Is it not true? 
eat your vegetables. No, eat your vegetables, right? When we were kids, my mom, you must eat. We, in my house, of course, you guys ate rice. We ate bread, okay? And we don't like, we don't like the brown bread. We don't like whole wheat bread. When you're a kid, you like the white. It's sweet. It's light. It's not, no, eat brown bread. We were the healthiest family in the world. We ate no sugar. <laughs> we ha never had dessert. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but <laughs> uh, we only ate whole wheat bread, whole grain rice, everything, even our peanut butter had no sugar added. I mean, it was just like we, my parents were health freaks, and I hated it, and now I'm thankful for it, right? It's good, actually. So Nathan comes to David and confronts him with his sin, the thing that he did not want to face the thing he did not want to deal with. And I tell you what, the grace of God comes to you in different ways, but let's call it through the prophet Nathan. It could be through a sermon. It could be through circumstances in your life that God forces you to face things. And sometimes God has a way of speaking through circumstances where we know God is telling me, I got to face my past. Or God is telling me, I have to fix a situation. We would prefer to just let it go away. But God keeps forcing it right in your face. I've had that in my life where I was running. I was running because I did not want to face certain things. And it kept coming up. And even in dreams, it would come up. And in circumstances, it would come up. And I could not run. I could not hide. I wanted to. By the grace of God. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, we got to face the darkness. We got, the, which darkness? The darkness within. The, 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 those shameful things that have taken place that we have been a part of, that we have done, that have not been covered, they've not been brought out into the light, they have not been washed in the blood. So the grace of God sends an unpleasant voice to David. Unpleasant. Even when um, Nathan is telling him the parable to bring it into perspective, what actually happened, David was angry. Who is such a hypocrite? Who is such a scoundrel that would do such a deed? And then Nathan turns to him and says, no, you're the man. I'm talking about you. What? It's very easy for us to perceive sin in other people. It's much more difficult to perceive our own sin. It's very easy to judge other people for their imperfections and their failures and their flaws. It's much more difficult to see it, or at least the degree of it, the severity of it, in ourselves. That's why the prophetic voice is necessary, the prophetic Holy Spirit. You know, in Revelation, it talks about the Holy Spirit as seven lamps, seven lamps, burning flames before the throne of God. And there are seven eyes eyes. I mean, the Holy Spirit sees. The Holy Spirit is a bright lamp, and He burns, and He penetrates, and He opens up. He sees it, and He exposes it, and He goes forth throughout the whole earth. The Holy Spirit will reveal sin, and He will bring it into the right perspective, the divine perspective, not the human-centered, man-centered, me-centered perspective. You will always find an excuse for your sin if you want one, always. But if you want to be right with God, you have to accept God's perspective about your sin. You know, that's what it means to confess. The, the Greek word basically means to say the same thing. Homo logon. Say the same. Logos is word. Homo is the same. The same word. Speak. Speak the same thing as God. So to really confess your sin, you know, you'll find when people say, oh, yeah, well, I did this, but, and then they have a lot of reasons why they did it. I'm sorry, stop. That's not confession. You're not confessing sin when you do that. But I said it out loud. Confession doesn't mean you just say it out loud. Confession means you accept God's judgment or perspective upon that. And, and you, you agree with this God's perspective. You agree with what God says about it, and you say the same thing. In other words, at the end, when... Nathan confronts David. David says what? I deserve to die. Well, he says the man should die. And then he says, I have sinned against the Lord, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
And then in verse 5, verse 5, David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. So David understood what that man had done was worthy of death. That's confession. When you come and say, oh, because when you're, when you're really confessing sin before God, you get rid of all your excuses. You're no longer going to try to justify yourself or excuse yourself but you, you're, you're going to come to a point where, where you can only plead for mercy. Mercy. No more self-righteousness. No more excuses. No more reasons. But when we truly confess, we stop all that and say, no. I have sinned against God. I deserve to die. Lord, show me your mercy. Show me your mercy. So, let me read on. I'll just start from verse 5. So, David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did, not, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. It's interesting how the moment before David was completely mengzai He completely couldn't see it. And now because of the parable, and then he just explains the parable. No, I'm talking about you. It's like all of a sudden the light goes on. The parable showed him things from a different perspective. We see that later on in David's life as well, oftentimes where he just wouldn't see something clearly, and then a, a, a picture is used, a parable is used, and all of a sudden he understands, and, he, and it, it affects him. But here he understands, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you've despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Okay. Let's read to there for now. Why didn't David confess this sin before? Why did he just let it go? Why did he must have felt guilty about it? There's some of the Psalms that seem to imply that David was struggling with this issue. He hid it maybe for a whole year. David was a man that walked with God, but why this time does he not want to confess? And I think obviously. One of the reasons, the very um, possible reasons, is because he knows that according to the law of Moses, the sin cannot be forgiven. So he feels hopeless. Adultery in Leviticus um, 20.10 says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. David knew that. David knew that the prescription for adultery was death. But David had not only committed adultery, he had also committed murder. And we know that according to Exodus 21.12, it says, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 24.17, whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. 
So David here has a double death sentence hanging over his head. Now you kind of understand why he would rather just cover it up. Why he didn't go to the priest and ask for mercy or why he didn't bring it out into public. Why? Because he's afraid. Because he's got, he should die. This is what we call a sin unto death. There's no forgiveness in the Old Testament for murder and for adultery. It's death. David knows that. I think another, maybe a lower level, level reason is simply because, Jolene, turn this down a little bit, yeah? Mike, Cotillion, Sadiqi, yeah? Because um, David is utterly ashamed of what he did. Think of it. The king of Israel, mighty man of valor, a man of prayer, a man of God, writing the Psalms, writing verses in the Bible, spirit of God on him, conquering Goliath supernaturally, a servant of God, even a prophet. The Bible calls David a prophet and a king. And he fell for that horrible fleshly vice of lust. He fell. In a despicable way. He didn't just fall, he didn't just look at a girl and have a lustful thought. He actually went and took her, and a married woman, and made her his own wife at the expense of her husband. And she he murdered the husband with the sword of the Amorites. This is humiliating, okay? And if you've ever sinned, then you know sin is humiliating. It's humiliating. That's why we don't want to confess our sins. One of the reasons, especially particular sins, are very shameful. They bring a lot of guilt. They're full of guilt. Remember later on, we're going to read about Amnon raping Tamar. Remember the story? That's David's son raping his sister. He was so in love with her that he found a crafty way to to get alone with her, and then he raped her. And after he did that, he immediately despised her. He hated her. He threw her out. He was so in love with her, and all of a sudden now he so hates her guts, he despises her. What's the cause of that? Certainly there's deep shame, deep guilt associated with what he has just done. And he can't stand this. He doesn't want to see it. He, wants, he doesn't want to see her. He's full of shame. And David is certainly filled with shame over what he did. He's not a man without a conscience. He's a man with a conscience that knows the Bible, knows the Word of God, as far as that goes. And so he doesn't want to confess. But when we read down here, verse 13, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. When David confesses his sin, when David admits, it is me, I am the man. I do deserve to die. What does God do? Well, through the prophet, he tells him, and Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. Now, that is worthy of rejoicing. Great, great rejoicing. In fact, I believe David wrote about this later in Psalm 32, where he says, in Psalm 32, verse 1, you can turn there if you want. It's, it's requoted in, in Romans. But blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. He talks about his experience before he confessed and before he was forgiven. Verse 3, Psalm 32, verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. When you have hidden sin in your life, when you have things buried, it just kills, it rots away. It, internally. It rots on your inside. It, 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 it takes away your joy. It takes away your peace. It takes away your confidence. It takes away your, just the joy for life in general. You cannot lift your head. You feel ashamed. 
And even if you don't show it on your face, you feel it in your heart. David experienced that. My bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Ah, it's a miserable thing to be in the shame of sin. A A miserable thing to be in the guilt of transgression against God. To have fallen to some sin or some situation and have transgressed the law of God and dishonored God and disobeyed our own conscience and done what we know is wrong. It's such a humiliating, disgraceful, shameful thing. And David felt it himself. Day and night, he describes it, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I dried up spiritually. I dried up emotionally. All my joy was gone. My, 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 my peace was gone. My faith was gone. Your faith will die. Sin will kill your faith. There's so many times people fall into sin, and then shortly after they lose their faith, and they blame God. Oh, God never came for me. God never answered my prayer. They'd be falling a bit. Of, the real reason they lost their faith is not because God never answered their prayer or whatever. They fell into sin. They, they fell into some sin, and they did, didn't, didn't get cleansed from that sin. They didn't get right. They didn't get washed. And then that will lead into the corrosion of your faith. And that will lead into bitterness against God. Actually, you've been contaminated by your own sin. If you don't get it right, if you don't get it in the light, it will kill your faith. It will destroy your faith. You can't live with uncovered, with covered sin. You can't live in faith. You can't walk by faith. You've got to get it out. It's got to come into the light or it will destroy you. It's either going to come out and be dealt with or it's going to remain hidden and utterly destroy you, destroy your faith, destroy your life, destroy your relationship with God. And then in verse 5, After he says, Selah, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. Friends, that's the answer right there. To acknowledge it to God, to not hide it. He said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Hallelujah. That's the path. Now, I find nowadays people prefer to make light of sin. They have a kind heart in that they don't want to make people feel bad. So they say, oh, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, everybody's imperfect. But that's not the right way to deal with sin. That is not the right way to deal with sin. The right way to deal with sin is treat it severely as the Bible treats it, to see it as God sees it, get it out, and get it cleansed. Get it washed by God. Let God's grace cover. Let God's mercy come and wash it away. Don't just pretend, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not. That's like... That's like um, heal, Like Jeremiah speaks of healing the, the wound of my people lightly. Healing the wound of my people lightly. The false prophets came along, and they were very kind to the people. So everybody loved them, right? Oh, this pastor, he's great. He's very nice, very warm, very encouraging all the time. And he never confronts me about my sin. He never tells me I've got to repent. He never addresses these issues of the heart in my life or whatever. That's not, a, that's not a true prophet. That's the way people like to deal with sin nowadays, but it's not the biblical way at all. God is not pleased with that. God is pleased when we take sin very seriously, like the Bible does. We deal with it face, you know, head on and get it in the light. Deal with it properly, and you'll be set free. That's the path. It's not the easy path, but it's the right path. It's, the, it's, it's God's path. And so David knows the joy in Psalm 32 of transgression being forgiven, his sin being covered, and that the Lord is not imputing his iniquity to him. Even though, yes, he has transgressed, yes, he has sinned, yes, he has committed iniquity, but God has removed it. As far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed my transgressions from me. Can you say that? Can, you should be able to say that. It shouldn't be, well, I've never really done anything that bad, so I think everything's okay. You're deceived. You're deceived if you think like that. Well, I mean, I'm not that bad, and I, you know I never killed anybody. You don't know what sin is all about. God 
looks at the thoughts of the heart, you understand. God looks at the motives. God knows how corrupt and depraved we are on the inside. And when people just have a superficial view of themselves and think, no, I'm a good person, they don't know the truth yet. The truth is there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we all need to have a proper understanding of that so we can have a proper understanding of the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God and how precious it is. So David here, hearing these words from Nathan, is like life out of death, you understand? He has a double death sentence hanging over his head. Now the prophet comes and boldly rebukes him, and he's like, I'm done. Whoa, I'm done now. Like Isaiah in the temple when the Lord appears to him. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Amongst the people of unclean lips. Woe is me. Woe to me. Woe to me. But then God comes and brings mercy. So this is um, really a wonderful picture of the grace of God. I want to point out another part here where he mentions verse 15, the latter part of verse 15. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. Whose wife? Uriah's wife. It's emphasizing David's sin. He stole another man's wife. Committed adultery. It's emphasizing the ungodliness. But remember that the Lord has decided to put away David's sin. He will not die. But the child must die. But look at this. Go down to verse 24. Then David comforted Bathsheba. What does it say? His wife. And went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So there's two things here. One is just above this, it talks about this is Uriah's wife. It's emphasizing David's sin. Now it's saying David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. God has forgiven David. God is redeeming the situation. And now what happened was the, the, the child born when it was Uriah's wife died. But now the child um, that is born after Bathsheba has become David's wife will live and be the king. David had many sons, but this one, this one is the chosen one. In fact, it says now the Lord loved him and sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord, which means beloved of the Lord. Now, this is amazing. That's amazing. So what we see here is a picture of the grace of God. We see a picture of the restoration of God for a horrendous sin committed by David. And it is actually astounding that God has shown such grace and such mercy. Because it, it goes, in a sense, against the law itself, which God has determined uh, adulterers die, murderers die, God forgives him. This woman is not his wife. God says, it's your wife. The first child dies. God says, I'll give you another child. And not only that, but this is beloved of the Lord. This is the chosen child. That's amazing to me. You know, Solomon is the one in, like, um, Psalms and things like that. Where it talks about the, the, the one who has been begotten, begotten. It's talking about Solomon. And that's really a picture of Christ, the only begotten Son of God. So that's how high of a, of a level that Solomon is placed on in the Bible. It's amazing. Okay? Now, that's the sweet. Now for the bitter. Normally we go for bitter and then sweet. That's the sweet. It's sweet, sweet right? We, we should know even a sin unto death when it's truly and genuinely brought into the light, turned from, and confess God will forgive it 
And that is our hope. And not only will he forgive it, but he will restore. And he will bring mercy and redemption in the midst of our wickedness. That is amazing. That's amazing. And we need to cling to that. Because now we're going to go into the second part, which is not so encouraging. But it is true, and we need to know it. Let's go back to verse 10, chapter 12, verse 10. Listen to this declaration from the Lord against David from Nathan. Now, therefore, well, let me back up a little bit. Verse 9. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, he's reiterating, this is what you did. This is your sin. What's the result going to be for David committing that sin? Does he just get off scotch-free? Does he just get a out-of-jail-free card? Does he just, is he just able to walk away, you know, just, yeah, I'm sorry, I did a bad thing, but it's okay, la. we just go away free, there's no problem. No, that's not the case. That is not the case at all. And we see here something that we seldom focus on, but we need to focus on it today because it's the reality. It's the reality. So after he denounces David for what he did, verse 10, he says, Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. We're now talking about the consequences of David's sin. These are going to remain. Now, he should die. So the worst part, God has had mercy on him and will not put him to death. He should go to hell for it, but God has forgiven him and will put that part away. But he's not going to get away free. He's going to pay a price for what he did. And the Lord is the one who is determined David will pay a price for what he did. He says, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, look in verse 11 when he says, Behold, I, who's I, who's speaking here? God, not Nathan, it's God. Yahweh, God, is speaking. I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I will take, I, I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And then skip down to verse um, 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Three things are mentioned here. One is adversity. God is going to, the result, the consequence, one of the consequences of David's sin is now there's going to be adversity from it within his own house. It's going to rise up against him. Another is that the sword, death, untimely death is now going to be released in his house. These are the fearful consequences of David's sin, even after the sin is forgiven. It has, he sowed the wind, and he's reaping the whirlwind. In other words, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. And even though God often mitigates the consequences of our sins in this life, and uh, most uh, uh, important of all, he does forgive sin. There will often be fearful consequences, painful consequences that will continue after the sin is confessed and forgiven, and we have to deal with it. So David is going to have adversity within his own house. David um, is going to have a sword, untimely death. It's actually four things. His wives are going to be publicly I'll say this, I'll use a, a, because of the children, violated. The wives are going to be publicly violated by another man. And the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with is going to die. 
going to die. You know, if you just read that and think, oh, that's, that's too bad, and then just keep reading on, you might not catch something very important. The rest of the book, the rest of the life of David is basically an unfolding of those events. In other words, immediately after this, we have chapter 13, which is where David's son, one of his sons, Amnon, falls in love with his sister from a different mother, but his sister comes up with a scheme to get alone with her and then forcibly violates her. Now this is a scandal. It's, it's, it's directly connected. David is now in his own house beginning to experience the consequences of his wickedness. God has forgiven him, yes. God has even blessed him with a child, yes. But there's certain things that are going to keep going and they're going to play out the rest of his life. He can't get away from them. Rape. His, this is a scandal. I don't know if you've ever had a scandal in your family. Um, something bad, really bad. Something that you don't even like to talk about. Most of my life, we never really had anything. In the last couple years, we had something that it makes me, even to this day, I don't even know what to think about it. It's so tragic. Such a tragedy. This sort of thing happening in David's house, in David's own family, is an absolute tragedy, but that's not the worst. The rape of his own daughter by her own brother. After this, we see this chapter 13 now, verse 14. That's where Amnon forces his sister. Then, what's the result of that? Verse 20 the latter part of verse 20. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Her life was destroyed. A young virgin, the Bible calls her, a beautiful young virgin, her whole life ahead of her, unmarried, pure young lady, violently forced by her brother. Her life is destroyed. She remains desolate in the house of her brother. All of her hopes, all of her dreams, all of her futures utterly destroyed. What a tragedy. For his, his lust, he destroyed his sister's life. Not only that, verse 22, And Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. Now this is, the, this is Tamar's older brother, he absolutely despises Amnon for this. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Now there's division in the house. Division, hatred between the brothers. It wasn't there before. They were one big happy family. Now you've got one brother falling in love with his own sister, violently violating her. And now you've got hatred. Now you've got intrigue. You've got conspiracy. Look at verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Watch now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of Absalom, Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Now Absalom murders his own brother. But remember where this began with David looking lustfully at a woman that was not his wife. David using his position and power to take that woman and commit adultery. And David, because of his pride and his inability to face the consequences, to cover it up, hide it, even to the point of murdering the woman's husband. Again, God's forgiven him. He ought to die. God didn't kill him. And this is the greatest thing of all. And David rejoiced in that. That's why he wrote Psalm 32. However, the consequences of that sin are not magically reversed. 
He set things in motion that he has to deal with now the rest of his life. By the devil? No. By God. God determined it. Was the devil doing it? Well, certainly the devil was the one that would put it in uh, Amnon's heart to want to be with his own sister and then Absalom to murder his own brother. Yeah, the devil's at work, but God is using the devil. God allows the devil to accomplish his purposes. It was their own free choices? Yes, of course. They made their own free choices. They're Absalom, Amnon, they're guilty for their sins. They're going to pay. If they didn't repent, they will be in hell forever for what they did. But God allowed that to happen. And it's because of David's sin. It's not over yet. So Absalom flees to over, overseas, I guess. Hi, why? And then in verse 36, so it was as soon as he had finished speaking that the sons, kings indeed came, they lifted up their voice and wept. Also the king and all, his fam- all of his servants wept very bitterly. I just want to point out from this verse, David's whole family is now completely broken, broken, shattered. They're broken. They're broken. Why? Because of Absalom? Yes. Because of Amnon? Yes. But more so because of David. 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 He has to live with that the rest of his life. He broke his own family by his own lust, by his own pride, by his own murder, by his own unwillingness to get in the light and face the consequences. It would have been better for David to come before God, confess his sin, be forgiven and put to death. And he could have stopped the cycle, but no, it can't be stopped now. It's begun and it's going to go on. This is the law of sowing and reaping. And it has been violently set in motion now. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. Turn to chapter 15. We know that Absalom ran away, but David brings him back. And then look in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 6. Well, let me back up a little bit so you get an idea of what's happening. Imagine the, the sword that's piercing David's own soul when this sort of thing is happening. Verse 3, then Absalom, Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. And so it was when anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. The, the honor, the respect, etc., that was due his father as king, as rightful ruler of the land. Absalom came in and deceitfully stole it away, turned the people against the king and turned them towards himself. Can you imagine how David would feel? He'd almost rather die than to be so dishonored by his son. It's not over yet. Verse 13, the conspiracy is on and now treason is is the... The next, um, next stage, verse 13. Now a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the minute are, of Israel are with Absalom. So Absalom came, um, put together a full conspiracy to take the throne. First he took the hearts and then he went for the actual position. You know this sort of thing still happens in in the world today, it's called a usurping, usurping, taking what doesn't belong to you, taking away the hearts of the people. It happens in churches, happens in families, where people draw the attention off of the rightful leaders, 
or the rightful husband and draw it after themselves. Lord, have mercy. So I'm just going to, let's skip on. David now is fleeing for his life into the wilderness. He's become a refugee again. He's lost everything now. He runs into the wilderness in um, chapter 16 on his way out. When he, or imagine how he felt being pierced through with the sword of the betrayal of his own son. Who had already murdered his brother, his other son, that had raped his daughter. Now all Israel is rising up against David. David is thrown out. David is on the run. And on his way out of Jerusalem, chapter 16, verse 5, Now when King David came to Bahiram, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came, and he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Also Shimei said, thus when he cursed, come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. Now he's being publicly humiliated by this nobody. And at the same time, falsely accused. The things he's accusing him of are not even true. But the scary part is, even though those accusations were false, the reality is, deep in his heart, David knew, I'm paying the price for my sin with Bathsheba right now. I always thought David was such a righteous man, that's why he didn't do anything to the guy. Later I realized, no. David realized he's facing the consequences of his sin. Thankful to be forgiven, grateful to be forgiven, eternally grateful to be forgiven, but recognizing I'm reaping what I sowed. And you can't just undo a lifetime of wrong decisions in one moment. You can be instantly forgiven, but the consequences will not go away. It gets worse. Then verse 20, chapter 16, verse 20. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give advice as to what we should do. So David is out. Um, Absalom is in. And now David's own advisors betrayed him and become the advisor of his, betray his uh, treacherous son. Imagine that. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go in to your father's concubines whom he has left to keep the house and all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father then the hands of all who are with you will be strong now this is wicked wicked advice but somehow in a wicked sense it's the right advice for what he's doing In verse 22, so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. Absalom went into his father's wives, his own son. Now, I believe, I'm going to say they were violated. I'm going to say it was not willful. So what Amnon did to his sister secretly is now happening to David's wives publicly. What utter disgrace. What utter humiliation. How many more swords can go through your soul in the sight of all 
Israel. Publicly, now remember the word that came through Nathan the prophet? Was, that, was this not the exact word that came? This is, it's worse. The word was, your wives will be taken from you publicly and given to your neighbor. It's given to his son. They were given to his son, his own flesh and blood. gets worse. We have to understand, lest you think, I can sin and then God will forgive me. No, 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 no. When we think like that, we are utterly deceived. Anybody who's lived through such a thing would never entertain such a foolish thought for a single second because even if it's true, God will forgive me, you will pay a fearful price for disobeying God. So, the battle is on. Chapter 18, the battle between Absalom and David. The result is the people, verse 7, verse, chapter 18, verse 7, the people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David and a great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. 20,000 people are now dead because of David's adultery and murder. Then, verse 14, then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. Now another son is dead. Another son is dead. Two sons, an abused and destroyed daughter, 20,000 innocent men, the kingdom divided, Israel and Judah beginning to divide, hatred, strife, bitterness, conspiracy, murder, adultery, in a sense, incest, Luanlun. Do you understand how the seed grows and bears bitter fruit? I do want to point out, though, all through this, the grace of God is there. As bad as things get, they could always get worse. The goodness of God is there. God did not allow Absalom to prevail. He allowed it to happen. He allowed David to feel the pain of it. He allowed um, Amnon Amnon to rape rape his sister. He allowed uh, Absalom to murder Amnon. He allowed Absalom to steal the hearts of the people and take away the people. But in the end, God brought it back to David. You see? God is not allowing him to face full consequences. Just some. Just some. You understand that? The grace of God is there. The grace of God is is still with David. God has not left David. Even though he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Even though after Absalom is killed, he said, oh, if it would have been me, I wish it would have been me that died. He would rather die than experience what he's experiencing. But still, the grace of God is with him. The grace of God did not leave David. In spite of all these consequences, he's reaping what he sowed. And God is using it. And you have to ask a question like, well, why? If God forgives him, why do all these bad things have to happen? Well, he tells us why. 
in chapter 12. Because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also is born to you shall surely die. And, and then um, above that, he says, verse 9, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? And the result of that, despising the Lord, now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you've despised me. So, in one sense, God is vindicating his righteousness. In other words, if God just lets David get away with it with no consequences, then it appears as if God is not so concerned with holiness with righteousness, with justice, with punishing iniquity and punishing crime. But God is very concerned about those things. That's the whole reason for the cross. Otherwise, God would just forgive us and be done with it. But no, God doesn't do it like that. God sends his own son. God allows his own son to bear our sins in his own body, to carry our iniquities in his own body. And that by his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Because God is very concerned about righteousness. God is very concerned about right and wrong. So that's one reason God cannot allow David to just get away with it and cancel it out. It would be unrighteous. And it would, in a sense, um, cause things to, to be even worse. But there's another reality here um, to what's happening. And that's that God is disciplining David. In other words, as he tastes of these consequences, he will certainly never do such a thing again. He will learn to be careful. He will, listen, if you've ever been burned by fire, play with fire, get burned by fire and not die, because David didn't die, thank God. Some people would touch it and burn and die. But God had mercy on David. He did not burn to death, thank God. But if you've ever touched and played with the fire, been burned by the fire, you, and God spares you, the results, the consequences will cause you to be much more cautious in the future. So in other words, it's for David's own good. It's for David's own uh, sanctification. It's for David's own growth in righteousness, in holiness, in obedience. And this is always God's intention uh, when he allows these sorts of consequences to come on people. Now, if God wants to destroy us, it's very easy for him to do it. If God wants to destroy someone, he just withdraws completely from their life. He takes away all sense of, you know, right and wrong. He takes away the guilt. He takes away the thought of God and just lets them go their own way, and eventually they'll sow enough seed and they'll just die in their sin and be lost forever in hell. That's how God deals with the ones that, he, that he's turned against completely. But when God does not turn away, look at Jeremiah 30, 11. See how God deals with Israel. In Jeremiah 30, 11, he says, For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all the nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice, and I will not let you go altogether unpunished. You see that? The nations will be destroyed, and they will not rise again. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. In other words, Jacob, I'm going to preserve Jacob. Did Jacob sin? Yes, many, many times. But God's going to keep reaching out and restore Jacob. But Esau, I've hated him. Just let him go his own way. So God's purpose in Correction. God's purpose is in allowing us to taste the consequences of our own sinful choices is ultimately, ultimately our own good, ultimately our own correction. I will correct you in justice. Remember, he could have destroyed us completely. David should have died. 
But he didn't. That was a great, great mercy. So these consequences are only temporal things. It's only going to last as long as he lives, but after that, David will go into paradise. David will live forever in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. But did you ever notice David's whole life was, in a sense, was a life of suffering? In the early days, he suffered as an innocent man. He suffered for his righteousness. Saul was against David because the hand of God was upon him. Saul persecuted David, wanted to kill David, chased him out of Israel, chased him into the wilderness because of his righteousness, because of his anointing, because the Spirit of God was upon him, because Saul was jealous. But later in life, David suffered, but he suffered for his own sins. And it was God's discipline. It was God's judgment on David, but not to destroy him, but to teach him, to discipline him, to bring him in line. Hebrews 12.5 says it like this, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Jeremiah 31, 18. I really like this verse. It's, it's like the voice of Israel crying out after they've been disciplined. And it says, 31, 18, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. And this is what he said. You have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an untrained bull, restore me, and I will return. For you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning I repented. And after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. Here's the voice of one who's been trained by the discipline of the Lord. It's caused him to see how serious sin is, how foolish it is to sin against God. How foolish it is to break God's laws, to live in disobedience to God. And let's look at one final verse, Jeremiah 31, verse 3. This is a verse that's full of hope, and it shows us God's heart. God's heart for His people in the midst of their sins. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So first thing, he's affirming his love for his people, Israel. It's an everlasting love. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines, and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. God is going to restore his people because he's loved them with an everlasting love, and those that respond to the discipline will be welcomed in, will be drawn in. Let's go before the Lord this morning in prayer. Father, help us, Lord, as we meditate on your dealings with David to remember 
the great mercy you've shown us, Lord. How much we, we deserve to die, but yet you show us mercy. You show us unmerited favor, forgiveness for our sins. You wash away our shame, our guilt, our transgressions. But Lord, teach our heart to fear you and to recognize that sin is not something to trifle with. For if we play with fire, we will be burned. God is not fooled. We cannot fool God. We cannot mock God. We will reap what we sow. If we sow to the flesh, we will reap destruction. So I pray that we will behold this morning both the kindness and the severity of God. How merciful you are to unworthy sinners on one hand, and let us delight in that and rejoice in that. And even after sinning, the grace that you showed David, and in the same way, you show us grace. But on the other hand, how much you hate sin and how severely you deal with it, even when it's been forgiven. I pray, Lord God, that this will be a strong incentive for us to not choose the paths of iniquity and unrighteousness, but to walk in your ways all the days of our life. So help us, Lord, to choose this day whom we will serve, to bring hidden things into the light that they may be cleansed and washed away, that we would not be foolish like King David was to hide his sin, try to cover his own sin, because we cannot hide from the living God. But we will get it out into the light, because we know you're merciful, and we know you will forgive and abundantly pardon if and when we truly confess, agree with God, and agree that we deserve to die, agree that we have fallen, that we have sinned, that we have done what we've done, and throw ourselves on your mercy. Lord, you are gracious and compassionate, and you forgive. You forgive, Lord God. Just as David said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Thank you, Lord. Let everyone in here have their own testimony of the great mercy of God for our great iniquities against you. Lord, let each one be able to say, as far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed my transgressions from me. Lord, let that be our song. Let that be our proclamation. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Lord, let each one walk out of the here this morning knowing the grace of God, the true grace of God, and knowing the true fear of God. That we would not just pick and choose and take the part that we like, but we will face the reality of who you are and how you deal with men, both in your mercy and both in your severity, both in your wrath and both in your uh, forgiveness and your grace. So, Lord, I just pray a blessing over everyone today. Lord God, please let, let us not walk in our shame. Let us not live in our shame. Please, if anybody is um, struggling today, struggling with the consequences of their past sins or struggling with the shame, struggling with bringing something into the light or truly breaking with the past, I pray that today you will grant, grant grace that they will be able to do it in the fear of the Lord and in the grace of God that you will come and draw them out of their sin, draw them out of hiding, draw them out of 
covering up like Adam and Eve after they sinned. They tried to cover themselves, but they could not hide from the all-searching eyes of God Almighty. In the same way, when we've sinned, when we've fallen, we cannot hide ourselves from you. We cannot hide ourselves from facing what we've done. So come into the light. Come into the light as God is in the light, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've got to come into the light. So I pray for anyone here who's struggling today that, Lord, that you will draw them out of darkness and that self-imposed prison um, of shame, Lord, and guilt, condemnation, that you will draw out and bring into the freedom that is in Christ, even if we have to face consequences. But yet there is freedom in Christ. Freedom. Freedom in Christ. So I pray for that freedom, Lord. And I pray for the fear of the Lord to know how we will reap what we sow. Therefore, let us walk. Um, let us walk cautiously, carefully, and do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people today. Drive out every demon, every lie of Satan. Lord, I pray every sickness, every disease. I just pray, Father God, that your healing power would be manifest today in your people and Lord and your grace to set free from every every trap of sin and oh Lord the guilt of sin the shame of sin Lord please wash it away Lord God remove it as far as the east is from the west Lord let your people be free Lord God let your people walk in the light and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ Lord let your people not fall into the trap of the devil but let your people arise and become a mighty army, hallelujah, of saved sinners, oh God. We do not deny our sin. We do not hide our sin. We do not pretend we don't have any sin. But as you said in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But my, my little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Lord, I thank you for that provision of grace for us, that there is always hope for us, even if we've fallen, Lord God. So, Lord, let that grace work in our lives today. Let your people be set free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.